Hello, and welcome to BrainChips All Things AI podcast live from CES. CES hasn't officially begun yet. It's January 8th, late in the day, but we have uh, a surprise guest, Dr. Ian Cutris, principal analyst with More Than More and Tech Tech Potato. Welcome, Ian. Hey, Dan, Dan. how's it going? Not too bad. Um, so what are your thoughts? You've been here a couple of days in Las Vegas. How's it treating you? Uh, Vegas is a unique experience. It's great that all so many companies and people are here. Um, a lot of people are still in that sort of post-pandemic phase of meeting people for the first time since the pandemic. So every 10-minute conversation becomes a two-hour conversation, and and that that's amazing. But we're all really here to see what's the latest and greatest in in hardware, in technology, and it's a consumer electronics show, right? So consumer stuff. Um, yes, always really fun. And speaking of tech, I mean, you tend to go pretty deep. Um, but stepping back, what was something that really caught your fancy? Is something that's cool that uh, you think the world will be surprised by at this CES? Yeah, it's um, everybody keeps talking about you know killer apps for machine learning, for AI, for generative AI. Um, and, you know, we, we've had sort of the killer apps in smartphone for a while. It's everything to do with the camera and engaging with the camera and things like PC are getting there with, um, you know, noise cancellation and like background blur. And the thing is, what do we do beyond that? And, and some of it's, you know, large language models or stable diffusion. Um, so a lot of companies, while they're traditionally tech, they're also trying to find out what's the AI, what's the machine learning angle we can add, because that's what the investors want. That seems to be what the end users want, or at least if we say enough in our marketing, that is definitely what the consumers want. Um, I mean, yes, so, so far in the, sh in the show, um, been speaking to a few companies, AI PC is pretty hot right now because all the companies are coming out with all sorts of different hardware for um, so people can run machine learning models locally on their devices, um, whether that's like, you know, laptop or desktop. And again, finding the killer application for that. Um, the best demo I, I've seen so far is actually one for video games. Um, so the whole concept of generative AI is, you know, you go to chat GPT and you ask it a question, it gives it, it gives you a reasonable response. Um, whereas if you're in a video game, maybe you're speaking to somebody in a video game and traditionally they've always been very scripted. Um, but what if you could have a dynamically generated response based on based on what your input? So modern games you usually have you know three, four, five inputs that you ask the character, and then they have scripted responses. So what if you had the three, four, five inputs, but then you had a you know a generated response? Then take it a step further, and you could have a variable question or input to that character, and it would get a response out of. So a, a good demo I saw was was that in game where you had two non-player characters and a character person, and you could speak to the non-player characters through a microphone. Mm -hmm. It would use a model to do speech to text locally, then go to the cloud, do a generative AI output based on that question, do a text to speech generation in the cloud come back to the device and then convert that speech into model movements inside the graphics engine. Um, so you have conversation with, with these characters, either, you know, in the style of the game, in this case, it was, you know, post future apocalyptic, but ramen bar. <laughs> so you could ask about the ramen, you could ask about, well, you know, what's the best sake on the menu or um, have you got any good contracts from the syndicate recently or whatever? Or you could ask it about what their favorite flavor of cheese was. And yeah, the model had some concept of, you know, what it could be. And you're thinking, extrapolate this to um, human worlds and non-human worlds or Lord of the Rings. Or I even asked it questions in Spanish and it understood Spanish. So they had the model trained in different languages. Um, there's a lot of talk right now about the future of video games with machine learning and generative machine learning and generative AI. Um, you know, not only the data that the model is trained on, but how do you efficiently make the guardrails so that if you've got a game based on, say, Peppa Pig or Coco Melon for your little children, that it's actually given responses appropriate for that. Um, still such a nascent 
I mean, machine learning itself is still so very nascent, um, but we're getting, you know, a couple of steps up the ladder um, to improving some of those exper uh, experiences. And that that's in video games. Let's extrapolate it to enterprise type environments, getting the machine learning models to help with engineering and mm -hmm. architecture um, and, and, and other future generative um, concepts. Um, and that's just language. What if we do climate or what if mm -hmm. we do industrial automation or um, mm -hmm. medical? Um, it was a very fun demo. It's a couple of companies were working on it and it's very clear they've been working on it a while. And yeah, because we're still so new, these things do take time. But um, for me, because it was a demo with a very interactive experience um, that I tried to break because I'm the guy who tries to break things. Um, yeah, it was fun. Yeah, no, that's. I think you you said a couple of things that really resonate. Right, one is well, we are still, in spite of all the hype, we're still mm. nascent in AI and machine learning. And two, it's becoming more of the way of the world. So compute itself is going down with an AI mindset, mm -hmm. right, or has to to kind of continue. And the third thing, of course, is that there is a lot more that has to happen closer to the sensor or to the interaction, mm -hmm. uh, not just in the cloud. Yep. Right. And and I, I do think that um, the more you think about it from that standpoint, getting intelligence closer to the sensor is interesting. Um, so from your standpoint, are you seeing technologies moving that way? And if mm -hmm. so, uh, is that accelerators in particular is it cpus and gpus uh, or do you actually see a, a growth of more hybrid heterogeneous architectures to do that it it's an in interesting question because you got to think of it from two sides and really it's software versus hardware mm -hmm. um, and obviously from a hardware perspective it depends what sort of company you are mm -hmm. right whether you're data center inference or data center edge and obviously a data center inference everything wants to be in the cloud because that's how they generate their business um, whereas if you look at the software developers trying to find the solutions, um, they will do a mix of what's best for the customer at the end. So maybe it's latency and then, or whether it's throughput or whether it's uh, cost to inference as well. Um, so, so you'll have the example I gave is if that's a service made available to game developers, right? that service may be predicated on how much they do in the cloud. So maybe they want to focus more on the cloud. However, if you want things to run as fast as you can, you need it natively. Um, so the right now, a lot of money around machine learning is, spe is speaking about the hardware around training because we're talking about large models where you need hundreds of thousands of GPUs just to get enough memory to train these models. Looking medium to long term, a lot of people are thinking, well, maybe most of the revenue is actually in data center inference. You have these fine-tuned foundation models and your your like recommendation engines for Amazon and, and, and Netflix. Actually, you're doing tens, hundreds, thousands, millions of inferences per second, and the cost per inference has to come down, but actually your revenue model is based on those inferences. Um but then then you've got companies especially in you know consumer land like Qualcomm, you know they've got a smartphone SOC. So they're trying to bring as much as they can with machine learning, with generative AI to the edge, to the device, because it means you don't have to, even though they have a modem, right? You don't have to, have to end up sending data across the network if you can run it locally. Um, so it's always going to be a question of, you know, A, where's the re how is the revenue model being developed and two what's the end effect to the end user because if there's no difference in the end effect i've got a feeling that someone along the line would prefer it in the cloud because there's money to be made um there's, there's also an efficiency discussion to have there um one could argue that having it on the device means you're not sending data which saves energy but then also the hardware in the cloud may be more energy efficient than the user device. So where do you spend that energy? Um, that, that I think is perhaps a next year question sort of thing, but yeah. There's 
the other uh, angle that we have seen for doing more close to the device is the security and privacy aspect. True. Right. So it's not just the, so I've seen arguments both ways, which says, hey, um, I can see uh, more energy efficiency in the cloud if it was batched in a way and it was done a certain mm -hmm. way. I've seen the alternate arguments that says, if you go to cloud, it's more brute force because you don't lose the context that was available on device. So that argument could cut both ways, but certainly the uh, limiting the exposure of critical data or, mm -hmm. Uh, is something that I am seeing more of, and mm -hmm. maybe you are as well. It's uh, I, that ends up being very company and vertical dependent. For certain business use cases, where especially big companies, um, not only in medical, but I'm thinking things like automotive, they want to have all the models locally. They want to have the inference locally. It's it's the same thing whenever we talk about cloud resources. Um, do people want a, a cloud solution or an on-premise solution? Because you're, you're saying about close to the device. Maybe it's not necessarily close to the device, but close to the company, mm -hmm. right? And as long as you can have a secure chain inside the company that doesn't go outside, the, that solution is technically inter, internal cloud, not external cloud. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, th there's also the case for... Um, encrypted data anytime you have to transfer medical information for example mm -hmm. um if it was inferred on the machine where you're actually taking the x-ray for example then you don't need to go send the data across mm -hmm. a pipe that um could be influenced by external factors yep um yeah i, I think that there's so many uh layers to this mm -hmm. problem and uh yeah we've kind of seen you know, you've, you've kind of taken it from a company perspective, hey, it's a security mm. aspect of an internal cloud. But from a consumer perspective, there's a privacy aspect that comes in. I don't want the company knowing more than I need to. So I think there's plenty that we could probably spend the next few years discussing. <laughs> well, it's th things like fully homomorphic encryption, right? Mm -hmm. Can you do work on encrypted data sort of thing? Yeah. So <laughs> that's another topic. Um, and so... I, I kind of wanted to kind of bring it down towards, um, let's say, uh, where um, brain chips interest lies. Mm -hmm. So you've been exposed to all kinds of architectures mm -hmm. and uh, naturally neuromorphic comes up as one of the trajectories for the future. Um, what's your thoughts on that? And what do you see um, kind of the stepping stones for neuromorphic uh, capabilities to really shine AI in the future yeah it's it, it's it's always it's always this topic of um you know not uh von neumann versus non von neumann architectures um and when we're looking at how much compute is needed today or how much energy is needed today most of the non von neumann options offer orders of magnitude better energy efficiency uh, and in terms of circumstances latency and that's becoming really important as a lot of the things these things scale um and when you look at like manufacturing complexity and such on 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 the neuromorphic side especially not necessarily unique to neuromorphic computing we still have to find the right way of developing and implementing the models to maintain accuracy and make sure that you know all the people important in the chain from development to deployment understand what's going on Digital and regular compute is so easy to understand because we're so familiar with it. Now, neuromorphic's been around for decades, right? It's it's just in the last few years it's had this renaissance in the same way that you know other analog techniques and um and it, like that has has been going on. So making sure that the benefits of the platform are clear to see and understood. Um, not only from a fundamental, but also sort of like this machine learning context. And then we have to think about scale. You know, is 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 there a fundamental limit on the applicability of neuromorphic computing? Can we go all the way, you know, to um, you know, forward training and make a massive data center chips, or is it, you know, fundamentally going to remain on the edge as this sort of low-powered solution? Um I was speaking with our good friend Sally Ward Fox in the EE Times about some of these technologies. Um, it's like yeah, incredibly low power. So may, do they make efficient 
stacked chips such that you can scale in the three dimension the same way that digital logic can't easily. Um, you know, so there, 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 there are fundamental research avenues to take with some of this technology, um, some of which will only be funded by active deployment of the technology as it currently stands. Um, but it, you know, it's like a multi-pronged orthogonal attack vector on how some of these new architectures are going to be effective in the future, both um, not only as providing the customer what they need, but giving them a better than regular digital experience. Now that's that's well put. And in fact, from Brainchip's perspective, right, even though um, we talk about neuromorphic, mm. we have taken a path that is purely digital as opposed mm. to analog and it's more event-based. So it takes the inspiration from um, yep. the, the neurons, but takes a much more portable, pliable yep. approach. And the second thing is uh, instead of focusing just on spiking neural nets and models that are spiking, we've kind of taken on the ability to translate today's convolutional transformer mm. and other models into um, internal spikes. And that's right? not easy. And so we, we believe that's a good start. Mm -hmm. And certainly everything we see is for the edge, it makes a lot of sense. And we've been scaling it up. Mm -hmm. um, you, you can see the likes of IBM show, showcasing their mm -hmm. North Pole now, which is a yep. next, next generation version. So talking about cloud, not so much right now, but certainly from the edge perspective, seems like there is a quite a bit of value that we see mm -hmm. going forward. It helps that that market, the um, the cyclability, even though some of these products are like 10, 15 year market established product, the cyclability is a lot faster. Mm -hmm. their, their ability to pivot and be agile um, makes it very applicable. Cool. Well, um, as we draw this one to a close, uh, you've had a chance to come see uh, what Brainchip's showing at CES. Uh, what are your thoughts? I didn't break any of it. <laughs> I mean, I mean that, that, that's a good start. It's um, for me, I like looking at things and saying, "Oh, a is it effective? Does it meet my minimum specification? Does it meet my minimum minimum standards?" And and what what you guys have done is also in these demos is start talking about latency and power and what what some of these are, e e even though. A lot of them are like proof of concept demos. They could be optimized a lot better once they fundamentally get into either other silicon or, you know, establishing other products. The fact that you guys are at the position where you are already and you can show some of these numbers and you can be confident in those numbers um, puts it in, in good stead. It's going to be interesting to hear about how many people come through the door over the next few days because we're literally at the start of CES right now. Um and and whether that's press or whether that's customers mm -hmm. or whether it's business partners or investors, mm -hmm. um, and 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 also to hear uh, what they have to say because everybody has different perspectives. Yeah. And 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 you're like me, you like speaking to a lot of these people and finding <laughs> out what, what makes them tick. Indeed, yeah. I think the the main thing that we've focused on is the the breadth and the versatility mm -hmm. of going from the very edge to the network edge, if you will, where the cloud, uh, the edge box servers are. Mm. And uh, I think I would love to see probably um, a little more of that by the end of the show, see how many people talk through it. But also your feedback on this has been extremely helpful because it, it does touch on why we need to be versatile mm. <laughs> in order to serve at the edge. Yeah, it's... it's... There are a few companies that focus too much on one specific deployment. And if there's anything we've learned about a lot of machine learning startups, whether you're doing classical, whether you're doing um, things like neuromorphic or, or, or analog, you can't just do one thing. You've got to be applicable in so many areas because you've got to think about the business use case, the volume, the customer endpoint. And that, I think, is what makes this exciting. Cool. Well... On that note, which sounds like a happy note, <laughs> Ian, thank you so much for joining us and all the best for the rest of the show. Uh, thanks, Nandan. Yeah, and good luck to you too as well. Thanks. <laughs>